All right, I'm going to stay here for just a second. Yeah. Maybe I can get Bob to, there's Roy. Come on in, come on in, we haven't started yet. Or maybe I can rotate Terry into sitting over here and just letting people in. Oh, you just leave early. Yeah, yeah. Marilyn. There, nobody's waiting right now. See somebody? Yeah, it'll, it'll show up like just right up here. Yeah, I'll just click the chair. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I know we have some members of our class that are downstairs getting ready for the congregational lunch after the second service. And so this may be it. I, but I'm going to start by telling you, I cannot tell you how much I look forward to these hours. Sunday. I'm going to be in the draw here in a couple of weeks. <laughs> but I really look forward to seeing you and listening to you and hearing you and um, and teaching you and, and looking you teaching me. So I really appreciate this time to give on Sunday mornings to the Lord and to me. Uh, let's open with prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for the church, the head of the church being Jesus Christ. We thank you for the physical church on earth. We thank you for the universal church made up of all the saints, past, present, and future, that worship you, learn about you, praise your name, and give you all the glory. We would ask that we would that you would receive what we do this morning. To your glory, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we're in chapter 14. Last week was what? Quirky 13. We can call it Quirky 13 from now on. That is what its name is. It was out of place. It kind of was stuck in there. Paul decided to have a reboot right in the middle of his letter. 14 really goes back to where we were at the end of 12, which was his instructions to the church in Rome. Although it wasn't called the church, we'll call it Christ in Rome. And what, how to treat each other. And then he goes into the here in 14, how to treat each other. I wrote the word church up here. From the beginning of time till now, what has been the problem with church? What the people with? The people with. <laughs> Have not learned how to live together. Crying does not make it. You have to do it. People do. That was true back then. That's true yesterday. It's true today. I'm going to predict it will be true tomorrow. Let's <laughs> now being true. Matthew's sermon is about the vision and disharmony in the church. And it happens to be Philip. The church is probably the next week now. And the well, at least, yes, it, it's, it's, uh, it's our right. The problem with the church is the people in it. And Paul, in chapter 14, is going to tell us how we are to act. Um, chapter 12 is kind of a generic, it can apply to anybody. Um, this is how Christians should live with each other and how Christians should live in the world. Chapter 14 gets personal. Chapter 14 is talking about what's wrong with the church in Rome right now. And that's what Paul is going to speak to. In a sense, it's about 
eating meat and holy days. That's what it's about. We don't get how important that was 2,000 years ago to those people. So we can talk about it a little bit. But that's not the problems with our church today. What's wrong with the current church? There, there's always problems with them in the church. Disharmony and division and dissension. I, I know a church in East Presbytery where the pastor is leaving. Church grows on work. Uh, it, it happens. It happens today. It happens now. And you can say it's the people in it, and that would be true. But what causes us in this room or in this church or in this time to turn against each other? Well, differences of opinion, for sure. <laughs> Chapter 14 talks about um, the cultural and ethnic distinctions between the Gentile Christians and the Jewish Christians. They come from a different ethnic group. They come from a different cultural background. And they're put together in the church, and there's some friction. It may be worse than that. What divisions have we created in the church that are not material to the one faith that we shared? What arguments do we have that are not basic to the critical beliefs that we use to separate us from, from others? N.T. Wright, in his book, gives two examples. One is... What if I was to stand up here and say, the command the commandment says thou shalt not steal, but Paul says everything is ours to own. Mm -hmm. And I tell you that I would take Paul's word and I think I can steal anybody's things and I'll be okay. He compares that as being a basic commandment belief, thou shalt not steal. With a part of Leviticus that says you shall not wear clothing with two different types of material. Now it says that. Leviticus says you shall not wear clothing that's made up of two different types of material. I guess wool and cotton or something. You can't make, you can't put those together. Well, that isn't a long-standing Christian foundational belief. That has kind of gone away. And so that is kind of a if someone was to raise up and say, we are not following Leviticus because we're wearing clothes of different materials, we would all say, that's not, that's not so, you know, that's not critical to a Christian believer to to, to follow. Um, of course, the problem anytime you raise these issues is how do you decide which side it falls on? How do you decide what's which important and what's not important? Which one was not critical? It's just not critical. You don't do that with any question you want. And, and you can do that with any issue that comes before the church. But what is one thing that dominates division and dissension and, and, this, and, and hurting the Peace and, 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 and fellowship of the Christian community. Oh, yes. So, so. It's usually so. When you are self righteous, when you're saying, I believe this and you have to too, what has that done? That's, that, that's for your glory. So you've got it all figured out. And so when Paul talks about in this first section 14, the weak and the strong, he's not talking about, uh, or the immature and the mature. He's talking about the mature people telling the weak people that they're stupid. And, and my granddaughter says they don't say stupid. So the weak, strong people tell the weak people that they are ignorant, or they're dumb, or they don't, they don't get it. You know, we'll, you know. It'd be like our session coming to us and saying, here's what you must believe. And if you don't believe it, then you don't belong here anymore. And the weak people, the new believer, doesn't know the, the secret handshake. The new believer doesn't know everything about how we do things in the church. The new believer doesn't know how rich 
God's sovereignty is and how important the death of, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is. The new believer might say, I believe, but after that, I don't know what I believe. And how do they feel when somebody comes to them and says, well, let me tell you, I've been a Christian a long time, and I've got all figured out on this is what you believe in ABC, and if you don't, um, what are you really saying when you say that? If you don't, you don't belong here. That's what you're saying. What does that mean? That means go somewhere else. That's that's an awful thing. That's what was kind of going on in Rome. We think Romans, this letter was written after, I think it was AD 54. The Jewish people were kicked out of Rome by an emperor. They were brought back in AD 54. They were allowed back into Rome. We think the Gentile Christians had created the church and had set out to do things. And the Jewish Christians came back and there was friction between the new and the established people. And that's what Paul is talking to. It may sound like, me too, who cares about this? Holy Day, who cares about Holy Days? But to them, it was very important. We have sacred temples too. We have important things that we think we figured out that we are offended when others have to come to that conclusion or will never come to that conclusion. But when the self gets in the way of the body of Christ, peace and understanding are soon to disappear. And that's what, and why would Paul be scared by that? Why would Paul be worried about dissension in the body of Christ? If it drove away one Christian, Paul would be upset. If one Christian said, that's it, I'm done, I'm out of here. I'm going back to the pagan holidays, they're easier. Or I'm going back to the pagan beliefs. Nobody makes fun of me there. Paul would be offended. In fact, Paul in here says, it, that would mean, I need to go find it. Go find it. Paul says that driving somebody out of Christian church because of your self centeredness would be an offense against the death of the Messiah. Undoing the work that Jesus accomplished on the cross. It would be a reversal of priorities from focusing on Jesus to focusing on the issue, whatever it is, the issue of humanity. And it would pull down the house of the church, which God is so careful for. Paul thinks that is a very serious problem, and that should be avoided. Now, I want you to understand that when Paul uses the term weak in the faith, that does not mean the faith is weak. He's not saying they have thin or watery faith. He's not saying they have shaky or wavering belief in the faith. Weak, weak believers tend to be what he means, new believers, new people in the church that haven't quite come to the maturity of some of the members of the church that have been long. So they have yet to understand the consequences of believing in God as creator and Jesus as the crucified and risen Lord. It is a reference to their understanding of the difference between issues that do not matter and issues that are critical. Social and ethnic standing do not matter. Old practices and customs are no longer applicable. There are instructions here, and Paul speaks to both the weak and the strong believer with what you need to be doing. All right, let's start Romans 14, 1 to 6. Somebody like to read that. Romans 14, 1 to 6. Thank you. My readers, my readers are up here on the from. Welcome those who are weak. Not for the purpose of quarreling over things. Some believe in eating anything while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God is welcome. Who are you to pass judgment on servants and others? It is before their own Lord that they stand or pick. And they will be uplifted for their work. 
for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge, judge all days to be alike. Let all the fully let all the, be fully convinced in their own minds that those who observe the day observe it in honor of the Lord. Also, those who eat eat in honor of the Lord, while those since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain. Abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks. All right, meat and holy days. All right. What's the problem with meat? Everyone ate meat two thousand years ago. It wasn't as if it was meat versus vegetarians. That's not the concept. It was meat, but how was the meat prepared? It was sacrificed by gods. That is the First Corinthians chapter eight issue. The meat that was uh, sacrificed to the gods, pagan gods, and then left over, got sold in the marketplace. How do I know that this piece of meat was not in the altar for the pagan god? That's the first Corinthians problem. Here, yeah, of course, the Jewish people didn't eat pork. And so Jewish true. people did not eat pork at all. So that wasn't, pork wasn't the problem, but pork was the cheapest meat. Pork was not the problem. They were not going to eat it. People grow up in more. Yeah, okay. Help people grow up and yeah. be mature and be respectful of each other. That's exactly what Paul was. They were concerned they weren't creating the right kind of meat. That's why they would go to vegetables. Was it pure? Could they eat this meat? Has it been slaughtered in the proper manner? Has it been cooked in the right way? If they were not pure, then some people would say, I'm just eating vegetables. Uh, what does that sound like to you? That sounds like the Jewish meat laws. That sounds like the Jewish Old Testament rules about. That sounds like kosher cooking. And that's it. You know, there weren't many kosher butchers in Rome. That wasn't where kosher butchers went for, for their careers. There weren't many Jews in Rome uh, to begin with. Uh, Paul had no problem with meat. Paul had no problem with meat if it was sacrificed to idols and left over. Paul had no problem with meat no matter how it was cooked. He saw himself as a mature Christian. He saw himself as that, that this was a minor issue, not a major point of basic belief. Um, since God was the creator of all things, all meat was good in itself and in principle could be eaten. You remember the giant blanket that Peter prayed to uh, dream about when he was in the Java, right? Java, the port. And the blanket came down, and he was supposed to go to the uh, Roman house, Cornelius' house. And he was seeing that, well, they're, they're different than us. They're not Jewish, they're Gentile. And, and the blanket came down, and all the food was in it. God said, I created all these animals and all this food, but I created good. That's kind of what Paul's getting in here. And that's, he calls that mature understanding of the concept of eating meat. But he, he says, there's a big but. If the result of you eating meat affects a weak believer's conscience and says, oh, I'm offended. You ain't meat in front of me. I'm offended. Then what the mature believer should do, even though they have a meat, they should abstain. They should be respectful of the differing opinions of the people that they are dealing with. They should grow up, as Richard would tell them, and be mature about it. That's the that's the ebb and flow of what's in chapter 14. If there's something that you believe. Totally, but in your belief, in acting out on your belief, you affect somebody else's comfort or or feelings. Then you ought to abstain from that belief, so that they feel comfortable, so they will stay in the church, and so they can continue to be fed by the church. Paul's concern was any act by the strong and mature believer could result in the weak and immature believer turning from the faith. 
that that's much never happened. Now, you have to notice something here. Paul never said Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians. He never uses those terms. He doesn't say the Jewish Christian believes this, the Gentile Christian believes this, and I want you to, to live together. Why? Because he didn't want to reinforce the ethnic differences in the church. Why point that out? Why keep saying you're different when he wants them to say we're all the same? And what are, are we the same in? What are we the same in, regardless of our age, regardless of our socioeconomic standing, regardless of ethnicity, our ancestors, our jobs? What are we the same in? Our faith. The faith is what makes us common. So let's let the other stuff go and not use it as grounds for dissension or division between us. Why distinguish faithful Christians on the basis of these other cultural or social standards? All with one. That was such a wide rule on his, on his part because words mean a lot, especially in the navigation. Yes. Yes. You have to watch the words because you can create more distinction. But just like you said. Yes. Yes, it certainly can. Fire him for putting aside his own prejudices. If right. he had any, yeah. To make sure that they were in good shape. They and, were, and that's, they were and and that's what he was doing. I don't think he could be good at playing by Okay. But their face were different. Their face were, well, started to do. Yes. So you, you can't say we're one in faith. Well, not everybody agrees with your faith. Well, but they. Well, we're assuming they all had faith that Jesus Christ was the Son of God and God raised Jesus from the dead. That's what we're assuming. Their historical faith for certain. That that that's the faith that we're talking about that would be common among a Christian church containing Gentiles and Jews. Their history was certainly different. It's hard to be able to talk about. Jewish Christians, not yes, not Jews. Are not that's right. That's right. They were not talking about Judaism, the Jewish Christians who are in the church in Rome. So I don't know, Terry, that that answers or not. It's not any. And, 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 and don't let us ever claim that all of our faith is exactly the same. The faith is the same, but that doesn't mean all of our beliefs are exactly the same. Under that, we may believe different things about Jesus and different things about God and different things about God. But what Paul said earlier in chapter 10 is all you had to do to be Christian was to believe that Jesus was the Son of God. Speak it, actually, he said, speak that Jesus was the Son of God and that God raised Jesus from the dead. You believe those two things, that's the faith he said we would all share. And then beyond that, we might disagree. It's one of us. And we sort of we don't have a problem with disagreement. The disagreement is to continue. Paul makes the point that we're all believers of the same answer that is God. And so I can't criticize a slave. To the same master that I'm a slave. The idea is why would I say to you, in order to be the proper slave, you need to do this, this, and this? But it's God that sets the same, and it's God that decides how we should act. It, it's um, that's we're fellow disciples of the same Lord Jesus. They are both invited, they are both welcomed equally. They are marked out by their common belief and faith. There are no grounds for separation. Ethnic identity or one type of behavior over another is immaterial. Ethnic identity and your behavior does not make a difference. Jesus welcomes all of you. Of every ethnicity, every type of behavior. Questions about that. Questions about needs. Questions about how it goes to me. Treat other believers. It kind of makes sense in a very theoretical way. But what happens in real life? 
in real life, if your beliefs are contested by others and you get defensive and you may think somebody else is being naive or immature or, oh, you just don't really understand. And in order to defend ourselves, sometimes we end up demeaning the person we're talking to. And Paul would say, hey, you're both following to Jesus. What are you, what are you picking a fight with another fellow Christian? Why are you picking a fight with another slave to God? Why do you? Why does that have to be important? And I think Bruce's answer is: it, it was. It's important to you. It's important to yourself. Your selfness that you be right. And they don't have to be wrong. They can just be mis. And and none of us is ever really going to understand the background experience of somebody else unless we have a long conversation. And actually, I don't think you truly understand it unless you became somebody else. That's impossible. <laughs> and that was the next it's true. And so there are, I'm not saying we're all the same. No, we are different. We can have that conversation we don't to get along with slavery. Okay. Well, verse 13 says, do not pass judgment on each other. And we'll get to 13 in a second. Yes. Uh, is, we really have to understand that. Yeah, I feel different. I really don't see things your way. Yes, yes. And you really don't see things my way. Yes. <laughs> well, they have to talk about it. We're going to have to talk about it. And more than talk about it, we're going to have to live together. We're going to have to worship together. We're going to have to work together. And you know, it comes down to that. Are you going to let this difference, background or ethnicity or race or or whatever, are you going to let that be a barrier to you working and doing the work of God? The emphasis should be enrich instead of destroy. <laughs> and some look at it then as if the differences make the body, which is the body of Christ, um, more likely, more enriching. Richer and, and deeper. Other comments, Terry. Thank you. Other comments. Well, I, I think that uh, the real issue comes between Christians and non-Christians. Okay. Um, okay. You know, like what we have. Yes. Okay. And I don't think this chapter no, deals. It doesn't deal with that. Yeah. You know, that's so well, that's where war comes in. I mean, we might have. Real arguments and established different sects within the Christian community, right. but we're not going to go to war necessarily. But we have in the past. Yeah. Yeah. You can say that now. You can say that now. Yeah. People believe in God. We can tell there's that. This war, Muslim and Jewish folk trace their. Right. Lineage back to Abraham and to Ishmael or Isaac. But you know, Northern Ireland was Protestants against Roman Catholics. Well, and, and, and there's plenty of those people that were Protestants and Catholics even, even today. So the whole abortion. So uh Paul can still write this letter today. But that just Jesus Christ. The reason this is so important we're talking about. How can you hope unless you're going to get along with yourself? How can you hope to get along with yourself? What the world? We have to run. If you can't get along with other Christians, what is your hope in getting along with the outside world, which is what you're talking about? It, it doesn't exist. Because you go to the outside world with your same prejudices and, and self righteousness and judgment and, and that sort of thing. How, how well are you going to do out there with that message? It's going to get thrown in the package. Yeah. No one's going to listen to you judge them or very few or shame 
or uh, yellow or whatever the term is. I mean, to be a missionary for Christ is not to <laughs> be mean to the unchurched. Although it's been tried. And then the special holy days. This may have been the Jewish Sabbath and the major Jewish festivals that Paul was referring to. He doesn't really tell us. Uh, it may have been the special feast days and holidays of the we're not really sure which way it's cut. Um, to Paul, the issue was of no importance. He was indifferent. The critical issue was whether whatever decision you made, you did to honor God. Whatever day you wanted to honor. I I, I get the feeling Paul would think you should honor God with every day. Make every day full. Make every day special. And honor God in that day. Christian was free to observe special days, not provided that this was driven by a desire to honor God. Those were the two issues in the Roman church that were causing these problems at that time. Other comments on one through six? There's a lot in there. Bruce, we're getting at this one. Wow, it's, it's pretty bad. It's pretty bad. 7 through 12 is next. It's kind of a different, it's the same thing, kind of from a different angle. We do not live to ourselves, we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the living, the dead, and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? For you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall be praised to God. So then each of us will be accountable to God. Verse 13. It's kind of the same thing. Do not condemn or despise other Christians. There is one Lord, and it's before Jesus and Jesus alone that every Christian lives and dies, stands, and falls. That Jesus has been appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. One, one day, this judgment will search out and test the entire life of everyone in the world. This is what matters. This is what matters. What do you think of that argument? What is what? How do you feel about that? Right? It's really basic. It's really oh no, this is one. This is, and if you've read the other letters of the gospel, you'll see Paul's comments similar to this in other letters. I mean, Rome was not the only church. In fact, Matthew said this morning in the sermon that all of Paul's letters were to churches that had disharmony and dissension. Even Philippi, the church that he really loved, it had problems too. Um, and so in the Corinthian letters, there's obvious problems with the church in Corinth. Uh, problems in Rome, problems in, in Ephesus. But it's just, it's just a universal problem of the church because the people in it. The people in it. It does not basic. Anything you want to add. Refreshing and basic. Difficult. And difficult to do. <laughs> Not easy to accomplish. We're always getting trouble with our self. We need to be justified. 
And one of the ways we can be justified is if everybody agrees with us. And if they don't agree with us, then that how does that bother us? Because it raises the question, am I wrong? I don't like that question. Of course I'm not wrong. Uh, but this person doesn't believe. So I either have to convince them that I'm right, or I need to cut them away, let them go. All the wrong people need to leave. There's no doubt. Each church would have one member, and they would have to be every because none of us can, because of our differences, a terrorist doctrine, none of us can say we agree on everything. But it takes what this approach does, it takes out the politics, it takes out how much money you have, it takes out who your ancestors were, it takes out what your job is, it takes out uh, all of the distinctions between us that are not important and just puts them aside and says, do we believe in Jesus and in God? And if we do, we'll accept the differences. We won't judge the differences. We won't uh, despise fellow Christians that are different. We can embrace the differences so that we can embrace our fellow man. We can embrace the differences. And so it's, uh, it's really speaks to the fact that some people are the king. Yeah. You know, basically, and that makes them different. It's like the tapestry is beautiful with all these colors and shades and all these things. God, you know, we're all different. It's okay. We have this beautiful tapestry to create amongst ourselves with ourselves and situated in the tapestry. And worshiping God and glorifying God and spreading the news. Paul is now appealing for Christians from all backgrounds to treat everyone with respect because they, like us, have been forgiven through grace and nothing that they earn. And we need to make that gift of grace a reality in our present common life. Not that you get stumbled and block to somebody else. Don't be a stumbling block to somebody else. Right. Christians must learn to respect one another and to find ways of living up and practice what it means to live to the Lord and to die to the Lord. That's a quote from the teacher. Um, and then the last section is 13 through the end of the chapter. It starts with, start with Richard's first piece. Like, there is therefore no longer, excuse me, let us therefore no longer pass judgment, but resolve instead never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of another. I know and persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean for itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks that. If your brother or sister is being injured by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. Do not let what you eat cause the ruin of one for whom Christ died. So do not let your good be spoken of as evil, for the kingdom of God is not food and drink, but righteousness peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. I love that phrase, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The one who thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and has human approval. Let us then pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for you to make others fall by what you eat. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that makes your brother or sister stumble. The faith that you have, have is your own conviction before God. Blessed are those who have no reason to condemn themselves because of what they approve. But those who have doubts are condemned if they eat, because they do not act in faith. For, for whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Same, same arguments repeated 
If you don't know them, then you might be so Well, that's and you have to know them to know what is there something. I mean, you can't you can you can inadvertently put a sign in the box in front of a stranger because you don't know what what is really bothering you. And then what do you do here? Then you talk about you know, <laughs> then you apologize. <laughs> Yeah, you become humble and apologize and try to try to make up for the inadvertent stumbling block that you may have that you may create. All right, see ya. Uh, I'm not going to be here next week. I'm going to be at Ghost Ranch for the Presbyterian meeting. Matthew's going to be leading the class next week. And then the week after that, on the 29th, is Chapter 16 and a chance for us to review what we've learned. And I'll be back for that. And then we shall be done. What is our goal? To live, to spread the major towering realities of God's kingdom, justice, peace, and joy. That is the text. Not for everyone to think, act, and talk like us. That is so hard to put into reality that everyone doesn't have to. Think, act, and talk just like us. Or else we would be back to the church at one at the time. All of main concern is certain believers in declaring their task will help another believer to stumble or fall. Our job as Christians is to make things easier for those around us, not harder. Our main concern should be for those around us, not us. That means selfishness, Bruce. We should be concerned for others and not be concerned for ourselves. There are times where mature believers need to hold back from their freedom for the sake of those who would be irreparably damaged by such behavior. And that is in uh, today, maybe in the drinking of wine. You just are saying that that offends another Christian brother or sister that you're, you're eating and drinking with. Um, do not insist. All other Christians conform at once to the freedom that you celebrate. And then this is the paragraph I read to you before. If you do, if you insist that all other Christians must act, think, and talk just like you, it would be an offense against the death of the Messiah, undoing the work that Jesus accomplished on for us. Our reversal of priorities from focusing on Jesus to focusing on food or drink. And it would pull down the house of the church, which God is so careful to do. Those are all things we don't want to do. Think about. But we don't mind doing them in our humanness, not knowing what the consequences are of what we do. Paul's film out there. There it is. That is in reality what we do. I was thinking yes, about Eating. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Whether they saw it that way or not. <laughs> Others. What do you think, 14? This is personal. He's speaking to the people at that church. It's not general, let's be nice. This is some areas that you have to work on. This is a homework assignment. You all need to work on this. Because I've heard, you know, I'm sure Paul has heard. I've heard that this is what's going on in the church and this is not right. So you need to work on this. And respect is a word we use all the time in society as well as in the church. Respect each other and not judge. Jesus said judge not so you will not be judged. Yeah. 
Someone who is uh, searching. That's not someone who's trying. That's not someone who is just been, we're all sinners. That, that's not it. the wicked, I think to me, are the ones that uh, don't even want to be free, don't even want to follow the rules. They want to be evil. I mean, the wicked are described in Romans chapters two and three as those who reject God, reject the existence of God, reject God's. Power over them and control and won't listen to God and won't follow God's rules. That to me are the And if you have somebody like that in church, what are they doing there? I mean, what good could they possibly do if they're there to say Jesus does not exist, God does not exist, I refuse to believe in God, I refuse that God has any rules that apply to me? They're, they serve no purpose except dissension division and to rally everyone. That person serves no good Christian things. You might as well let them go somewhere else where they can share their beliefs in common with others. But wicked, that is a very strong. That, that That's not sinful. We're all sinners. That is beyond. That is uh, that I'm just trying to respond for yourself. Quoting, I'm just trying to respond. And, and, and Paul would say, I would say, why are you here? <laughs> you don't believe what we believe. Uh, why, do you to, why do you need to come here and, and, and not miss a Yeah. Yeah, sins are not the issue. We're, we're all we all have sins to carry and confess. 
So, no, Paul could be, Paul was very rough on the church. Paul was very, I'm sorry, this is a high point for uh, JJ's thing. Yeah, yeah. Mark was a pretty easy Yeah, that's where we're missing. Almost right when you get into the different phenomenon. What are the doctrinal differences that separate people? And and he would look to the material versus the material. And and he might not be found. <laughs> because yeah. some of our distinctions are pretty traditional. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's easy to say this is the Orthodox way, and everything else is heresy. Okay, uh, well, that's easy to say, but who are you to decide what is real, what is false? It's the same. It's the same issue. There's a lot of similarities, even though there's doctrinal differences. Yes, and, and, and so, you know, so you can draw on some of that. You can certainly draw on. Them. I was I was confronted by the young man who said, in, in the lobby of the Presbyterian Church, he said, I was, I was told to go out and speak to a Presbyterian about what you believe. About you. Uh, my teacher, he was taking the catechism. And somebody said, you're the one that needs to answer this. And I said, oh, boy. <laughs> what, was it, was it some, what would you say? Somebody said, what do you as a Presbyterian? <laughs> and, and why and how are you different from Roman? What would you say? That's what I was being asked. That's what I was being asked. So, I would say what? The way I started was what we had in common. I started with we both believe in God of the Bible. We both believe in Jesus Christ, as God's only son. And and I went down, I didn't go too much further because I can stand in a body. It's just and it's off the top of my head. But then I said, now there's things that we disagree with, but the basic tenets of what we we both Christian. Yeah. And and I don't know if Paul would have been happy with that answer or not, but it, it would be, I think, consistent with what Paul is saying. Try to try to at least express the common that you share and consider whether the uncommon is material. And, and you know, I could have talked about the Eucharist. You know, uh, you know, the priest being our avenue for salvation and the mass being our I kind of got into all that, but that was a different business. And I'm not sure I was trying to get it. I was trying to say we were closer to the neighbors. And I don't know if it was right. Uh, yeah, I think that you were right because I think that the faces are all of our different people with their different experiences and cultures. <laughs> Born to traditions, yeah, are aiming for the same thing in their diversity. Yeah, I, I will tell you, Romans, and I was at Red Quaker the last Sunday to tell you, Romans, Roman Catholics considered to be a Protestant gospel. They don't like Romans, and you can see why. <laughs> the uh, the concept of service and works. It's not in here. The concept of free grace is something that Catholics have difficulty. Um, I, I don't know what else stands out, but the works for salvation versus the unmerited grace for salvation is a distinction. Um, they think we take. Romans and make it larger than it's supposed to. It's it's part of the Bible. They can believe in it, but we they think Protestants take it and make it more important than some of the other truths of the Bible. But we love Romans. It's it just fits. It's what we believe. And so to to your 
to your question, what would Paul say? Paul would say, what was what is in common between the various denominations? And what what do you disagree about? And then he'd look at you and I think he'd say, is that really important? Is that what you don't believe? Is that important enough to form a new church? Um, it's always, almost always important enough to break away. <laughs> <laughs> The denomination of the good news. Right. <laughs> but yeah. But we laugh at the music. But we laugh at We feel that way. Even if we don't act, we still feel feel that way. Well, as we try to form control in some ways. It is. It's not a house to the south. Okay, and stop it. You have to live through that. And then when you go to a place that's very different. They're certainly worshiping God, but there's that was so different that you can't get into it. So it's style enough to form a new denomination. Well, you know, that's what we're that's, that's the question for us. Yeah. Sometimes we're style. People have learned to learn to relate different ways. Very much so. <laughs> no, no, none of the sudden. None of the sudden. So Paul would say, put your ego in a box. Believe what is important. Live your life the way you do with the honor of God. And others live the way that they think or not. Don't try to be judged. And if you're trying to honor God and you and you honor God in this way and this way, and somebody else honors God in this way and this way, and get along with them, and don't tell them that they're doing it wrong. Don't put something, a wall or something block or barrier of some sort against their understanding. As long as, I think it's always as long as, as long as we're not talking about one of the central, basic, fundamental truths of Christianity, which has to be about Jesus. Uh, all right. Uh, Jane, you want to close with this? You have a doxology or something for us? <laughs> the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed, you have that for us? I'm just going to make a comment, just uh, if, I can, if I can form it. So, uh, but if somebody says, no, I, I don't believe in Jesus Christ, that's just not my belief, um, then, then does that mean that we are supposed to be kind and understanding and forgiving of them? If they, if, if they are truly non believers I don't think we're saying, and you can call them wicked and exile them from Church. working with them or, or even inviting them. Yeah. That was just my thought. I think of friends that I grew up with. Yes. They yes. separated from the Catholic Church. Yes, right. You know, that doesn't, because they don't share my belief, does not give me the right to go to war with them. Or, or, or yeah. condemn Oh, yeah. Yeah. That, that, I think that's the step too far. My uh, mother says double up kindness. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and maybe, 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 you know, you could say, if you want to talk about it, they say no, and maybe just leave it alone. And they're, they're there. And you know where you are, and they are where they are. Um, I don't know if you make them listen to you, you're going to be very successful. Right, right. So, what, why would you? Yeah, don't push it. Why would you push it? Why would you push it? Is this at all helpful or is yeah. this it's just too basic? <laughs> <laughs> of course. Well, 
Next Sunday will be Matthew chapter 15, and then I will see you all in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you.